All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined all the way from the other coast in North Carolina, Amanda Chevette. How are you doing, Amanda? I'm great, John. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to see you. Absolutely. Amanda's 20-year career has been focused in human resources, organization development, and strategic planning, and her business leading on leading purpose as a consulting and coaching firm that has been equipping and empowering business profitability through people development since 2010. Uh, your professional experience uh, includes four years as an elected local government official. My goodness, I think you need a probably a medal for four uh, years yeah. as an elected <laughs> <laughs> in local <laughs> local politics, yeah. <laughs> it was um, a blast. I'm sure. And currently you're a member of the board of the trustees for Isothermal Community College and is a stability leader for the Stability Network, a movement of people speaking out about their own mental health. Uh, and you're also now uh, vice president of human resources at a uh, higher ed institution. So keeping busy. <laughs> yes, keeping busy and uh, three teenagers in in so uh, in all aspects. <laughs> busy. Oh wow! I I saw a great one today where it said uh, uh, this like parents saying um, I bought a dog. I have three. I have teenagers, so I bought a dog so somebody would be happy to see me. <laughs> yes, yes, that's great. <laughs> like, I depend on my cats for the you know for the love and recognition. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right. And what we're going to talk today about mental health and particularly mental health in the context of the workplace, because um, one of the things, Amanda, like, I, I feel like we're finally start. It's finally becoming a subject that people are talking about. Right. Not mm -hmm. to say there haven't been people like you talking about it for years, but I'm just saying maybe in the general consciousness, we've been most people have not paid attention to it. And then I think the pandemic sort of brought people's awareness a little bit up. But we still we still kind of exist in a in in a culture today, I would say, where I can I could I could talk go into work and talk about any physical ailment in the world that I had and I would get sympathy and all of this kind of stuff. If I yeah. went in and talked about a mental health issue, the reaction would be very different. And it's because people it's scary for people and they don't understand how to react to it and people don't and themselves don't understand how to talk about it. So it's very, it, it's a very kind of, it's complicated, but very, it's very kind of insidious in its own way because everybody's mm -hmm. kind of stuck. Uh, so what, what is your experience been in helping both, both people who suffer and obviously in the workplace, how you can make it so that people can, feel okay to open up about mental health challenges and other people can feel okay that people have mental health challenges it doesn't mean because i always say like i break my leg you don't come into me say say oh my goodness i think john's got brittle bones i'm not sure if we can <laughs> trust him but if i come in and say oh i've got a you know some mental health issues and go oh does this mean john is a bit weak weak-minded i mean has he got pro you know should we trust him it's a totally different mm -hmm. approach Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it's a great question, John, because, I mean, you've really nailed it on the head in terms of what happens with folks. Um, you know, the people that are suffering are afraid to talk about it. And then uh, the people that are um, in the workplace seeing that happen, they don't know how to how to talk about it. Um, you know, when you're when you're out um, of work, maybe uh, you've heard of folks that get diagnosed with cancer and they're out mm -hmm. for these treatments with cancer and everybody's rallying around. They, you know, might send flowers, maybe send a, a meal. Another person can be out for debilitating depression and nobody knows what to say or what to do. I think it begins with conversation, really just making it okay to talk about in the workplace. That is mm -hmm. um, really the first step, as you said, mm -hmm. to, to just let it be part of the conversation. And and the other thing too, uh, Amanda, is even I, I think also people when they think of uh, mental health challenges, they think that you have to be at one extreme, right? You have to be like severely manically depressed or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I mean, stress and all of those things, I mean, there's a mental health element to them. So everybody should be everybody should be paying attention to their mental health. And I think that might help bridge the gap when they realize there's a mental health continuum, right? 
Well, there absolutely is. And and the interesting thing is, you know, we don't uh, often enough make the distinction between mental health and mental illness. Mm-hmm. We we do that with physical health, physical illness, right? But everybody has mental health, right? It, we we all have it and it is on a continuum. Some of us are diagnosed with a mental illness, right? Mm-hmm. A mental health illness. Um, but even those that are diagnosed with a mental health illness can still lead very productive, very happy lives. It's uh, like any other physical ailment. You have to do certain things right to take care of yourself. Uh, yeah, because I think a lot of people would be shocked probably with the amount of people who they perceive as having been, you know, being very successful, being totally together, all these things going. They'd be shocked to to discover that a lot of these people, you know, have struggled with issues or have, you know, mental illnesses that they've overcome or they've learned to. So and, and I think that's part of it is I think we don't realize that in our midst, there are many people who are dealing with these things, but they're but they're not letting them, you know, stop them. They're, they're, they're moving forward. They found a way of moving forward. Absolutely. I, you know, I'd love to tell you just a little bit of my yeah. story. Um, so I started out in human resources um, just right out of college and was pretty hard charging in my career in the early years, uh, working a lot of hours, um, really kind of running up against um, really burnout. But um, at, along the way, um, I really began to struggle and after so many years of having referred other people to our EAP or, you know, given the name of a local counselor, um, here it was my turn that I needed help. And I was, I was really ashamed, frankly, I I felt like, oh, well that, you know, other people, that's okay if they need help, but I felt somehow weak because, um, because I needed it. And I remember going into the, the counselor's office and actually asking the receptionist, don't you have a like a back door that I can come in? Because uh-huh. I don't really want to wait in the lobby. I was actually that was during the time that I was a local elected official, right? And so oh, I yeah. I, somebody might have the newspaper there. I didn't want them to, you know, recognize me. Um, fast forward about ten years, um, and I was actually diagnosed with a very serious uh, mental illness, and really thought that honestly thought that my life could be over because mm-hmm. um, when as you mentioned, like if, if it's a, an issue of brittle bones, right, we don't think anything about that, whether you can do your job. But if it's your mind, if there's an illness mm-hmm. in the mind, what does that mean for daily life? Um, and it took me um, it took me about seven or eight years before I could say uh, the sentence of what I had been diagnosed with before before I could say it without crying. Right. And uh. um and so, but in, in the last year, I've been able to share openly, yes, I'm diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And yes, I had some really scary times um, that occurred before I knew what it was and before I, before I got help. And, um, but in the year since, I've led a, a, you know, a productive, busy life, um, have a family that is so supportive and that helps me. And I've learned how to take care of myself, right? And so, but you're right. I think people don't, it's like we get this picture in our mind of what it looks like to be mentally ill. And until we come up against um, actually seeing, you know, someone that that is, we don't really understand what, what that looks like. Yeah, no, I would say a hundred percent. And I think the, uh, and, and I think probably there's, you know, paradoxically, uh, if you go through a process or, or go through an experience like you did, um, you end up probably maybe a little clearer um, and seeing the world a little clearer and your own mental, you know, capacities a bit clearer um, than other people because, you know, we live in this, especially today, we live in this world that discourages you from spending any time with yourself or in your own head. You've got a distractions, you've got your oh, yeah. TikTok, you've got everything. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I think, and, and that's why I think part of it, um, part of it is, you know, it's a great opportunity, paradoxically, you don't want to be in a situation like this, but it does allow you to have some start to have some clarity about how your mind operates and that, which actually yeah. could make it actually, in some ways, elevates you. Um, because most other people aren't even thinking about themselves right now, because they're so distracted. Well, I, you know, that's a good point. And I will say that, um, 
my level of self-awareness is Mm -hmm. um, much higher because because of that. Right. Like I have to really pay attention to the thoughts that are in my mind and, and, you know, the um, sort of pace at which I am uh, carrying on. It's important for me to be paying attention to that. And you're right. We live in a society where it's almost like we're encouraged to be on autopilot, right? Like there's just mm-hmm. always yep. so much coming at us and it's um, you don't get a quiet moment to sit and think. So, Yeah. And, and uh, you know, given your, ex- your experiences and also your experience with uh, running HRs and all of that kind of stuff is, um, so, you know, so when people, you mentioned you were starting to feel like burnout or burnout was coming. Mm-hmm. And I think burn uh, burnout to some degree, I think is, uh, is almost the gateway to mm-hmm. more serious issues mm-hmm. but but people don't really pay te- you hear people all the time saying i'm burnt out or whatever but they don't pay attention to what does that actually mean and is that something that you're just going to you know endure because ultimately as i said it can be a gateway to much more serious issues mm-hmm. for sure yeah and so if you look at um the research and kind of you know what what the uh, really smart individuals that have studied this stuff, what they say about it with burnout, it's very specific related to your career. Right. And so it's not generally um, like with depression or anxiety, Mm -hmm. you're generally feeling that about everything, right? Like what, whatever aspect of your life, but burnout is very specific to your career. So if you are finding yourself losing your joy at work, um, you know, beginning to feel apathetic or even feelings of dread. I mean, those are the warning signs, right? To, to be thinking about maybe this is, is burnout. But it's important to pay attention because absolutely, John, if you don't, you can wind up, you know, being along that path of something far more serious. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and, you know, I'm hoping that these attitudes are changing a bit. I, you know, even in, in, in so. my son's circle of friends and my son's 18, like, you know, and he's, he's got quite a large circle of friends, but he's got people in there who have got, I mean, it's one <laughs> who suffers from bipolar and so forth, but they all are, they just all are like, oh yeah, yeah. He's like that. And sometimes you have to, uh, you know, what they say, oh, you gotta make excuses for him because sometimes he's away with the fairies, you know? So, um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I go away with the fairies. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, what I mean is, like, he, you know, he'd just be all, you know, sometimes he'd be less focused somewhere and like completely. But anyway, yeah. but my point yeah. is, my point is, they have a, they have a much more relaxed attitude towards it. Totally. It's just like, oh yeah, whatever. Totally, and that's one of the the most I think serious issues facing us in the workplace because right now we have this conglomeration of um, Gen Z millennials. Um, mm-hmm the Gen Xers like myself, and we have baby boomers in the workplace who have really very different views, right, around Mm -hmm. mental health, mental illness, what all that means. Should it be hidden? Should it be talked about? Um, And I mean, Gen Z in particular, but even some of the younger millennials, they have grown up in a world where um, they hear celebrities talking very openly about their, you know, their struggles and their illness. And we grew up in uh, some of us kind of more in the Mad Men era, right? Where mm-hmm. like it, you 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 just you couldn't talk about those things at work. It was just very different, and so it's totally yeah. different. And and having my teenagers, like I, you know, I see that difference very clearly in them. Yeah, I mean, hopefully that's the that's the harbinger of things uh, changing in in the future so. for good. Um, so. But. So how would you advise if there were other uh, HR professionals or business business you know leaders or managers out there mm-hmm. listening how do you how can you create that environment where it's okay to talk about these things how so when you advise when you would advise somebody who in an HR position or or whatever how would you advise them to to make it because you don't want it to be like the initiative du jour you know right. where we have all these health initiatives and you put up a few posters and have a you know wave a flag and then move on that's right. Yeah, I think it's it, you know, it takes vulnerability, right, to talk about it. Um, and I think when leaders go first, uh, when a leader makes themselves vulnerable, then other people are willing to do the same thing and it makes it okay to talk about things. So I think as a leader, as an HR professional, um, if you're struggling, right, like uh, not necessarily with depression, but it, but an mm-hmm. emotional struggle it's okay to let people know, right? Like we try to sometimes be all buttoned up and like we have our act together 100% of the time and that's just not real life. And so 
um, making it okay to not be okay, as they say, I think is part of mm -hmm. it. And then, um, and then just to send those messages that um, we're not going to treat mental illness any different than we're, than we're going to treat physical illness. And, you know, in countries around the world, they're really making that point very strongly. Australia has got some really uh, interesting things that they've put into legislation around psychosocial um, environment in the workplace. And Canada has done the same thing. And I think eventually we'll get there in the United States. We're just not there yet. But I would like to think that a lot of companies will try to get ahead of the curve and and be doing that themselves. Yeah, and also, I mean, uh, I think just the medical profession here in general, because, uh, you know, let's face it, we've all grown up in culture. I mean, I grew up in Ireland, but it's the same here, generally, in my experience, is, you know, you have a physical ailment, you go to a doctor, GP, whatever. You have a mm -hmm. mental issue, you go to a psychiatrist, a counselor. But never the twain shall meet, right? It's mm -hmm. like they're completely divided, whereas mind body is so connected. And, you know, our, 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 our friends from the East have known this for a long, long time. But mm -hmm. I think that's something that has to change as well. It's like it's no good, you know, saying having all these health and fitness initiatives if you're not also looking after the mind, too. That's right. That's right. There's a movement right now called Before Stage 4. I think it's Mental Health America that puts it out. I may be incorrect about that, but it's essentially saying that, you know, we we talk about going for a physical health checkup every year. And many of us are very religious about that. We make sure that we do that. The insurance mm -hmm. companies pay for you to do that. They, you know, a lot of times it's not um, charged even in your deductible, yep. but we don't do that for mental health. And so uh, that movement is about like, that there should every year be a mental health check, uh, just the way we do for physical illness. And, um, you know, you hear about like with cancer, the stages, right? And so they're talking about stage four, meaning like that's the point where it's really hard to recover from. And so the same idea with mental health. Yeah, I think that'd be great. I, I think that'd be a fantastic thing for, for people to do. I think, again, then that would encourage people to think a little bit more, uh, not just about their own mental health, but just about mental health in, in general and realize, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that uh, 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 and be more accommodating for other people, too, which I think is is one of the most um, most important things. Um, tell me what were when you when you uh, when you you know, told people about your, you know, your bipolar, what was the most surprising reactions you got in a, in a positive way? Um, it has, it's been really interesting to see how many people have responded with, um, I, I guess the word I would use is admiration. And I, and I, you know, I've heard the word uh, courageous. And I, I mm -hmm. think that's the thing that people, um, you know, when you admit something that feels deeply shameful, um, mm -hmm. it does take some guts to do that. Right. Like, it, like I said, I cried every time I would try to say it for a very long time. Um, but you know, I think it's like anything you can normalize things. Right. And so, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a big part of it, but yeah, I, I would say the response has been very positive. Uh, you know, I've not been, um, I've not been fired from a, a job <laughs> or a client <laughs> and, um, you know, my, my kids don't think I'm crazy or at least most days they don't. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, and I think that's an important thing for people who are listening to saying that you might be surprised by the reaction of people when you do reach out, totally. uh, because like you said, like, you know, courageous and admiration because yeah, it's a, it's a huge thing. It's, it's a huge thing to do. Um, and therefore, I, I think, thank you for sharing that, because I think that's important for people. You may be very, very surprised by the reaction. And the other thing I just wanted to come back to what you what you mm -hmm. said earlier, it has given you a greater level of self-awareness. And mm -hmm. what I always argue is that self-awareness is the biggest obstacle lack of self-awareness is the biggest obstacle to success in 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 life in general in work and personal life and so therefore you know people you know maybe self-awareness is a is a good place to start you know you may discover mm -hmm. things about yourself about your own mental health but certainly i i think that's phenomenal and you know and there you go through your through your struggles you've actually ended up in a in some ways in a better place yeah well, I totally believe in um, bringing beauty from ashes, right? It's it's a promise mm -hmm. and it's true. And um, 
yeah, I think I'm definitely all the better for my story, right? I've learned a lot through that. So. Yeah, F- Phoenix from the Flames. Uh, that's uh, it's got a it's got a big ro- it's got that's got a big resonance in Irish history. But uh, yeah. that's for that's for another day. <laughs> yes. yes. Well, listen, Amanda, this has been fantastic. All of Amanda's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about what you're doing these days. Oh, well, as as you mentioned uh, so graciously, I do own a business called Leading Purpose. You can find us at leadingpurpose.com. But we are really focused on helping businesses equip their people, right? So that the so that the people in the business can really drive the profitability. And we do that through coaching and training and consulting. And then um, that's that is now my moonlighting yep. effort. Um, <laughs> so so now during the day, um, I'm a, um, in human resources for higher ed and really enjoying that as well. Yeah. And, and being where you can make a great impact on, on issues like this. It's it's the most exciting part. You know, uh, just a quick anecdotal yeah. thing. So. Um, I was in our DEI steering committee meeting the other day, and um, we were talking about our calendar of events and about recognizing um, Mental Health Awareness Month as part of a DEI calendar. And someone said, oh, well, mental health isn't, that's not part of DEI. And so we had a really interesting conversation about how, no, actually it is, because anything that is different among us, right, any diversity that is what DEI is about. And it's about making people feel seen and heard and connected and belonging. And so it really opened the door for a beautiful dialogue. And and to to know that I'm, you know, a part yeah. of an organization where there's, you know, the opportunity for those conversations is really tremendous. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point because, I mean, there's nothing that feels in many ways more exclusionary than it does when people are struggling with mental health because they do oh feel it, they do feel excluded and they do feel absolutely. isolated. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Well, that's excellent. And I hope other people will take that on board, too, and realize that there are so many more dimensions to these things. Um, so, listen, thanks again, Amanda. Thank you for watching, listening, and I will see you all again very soon. Thank you so much, John. Thank you.